et démocratie, mia pire et ai. El Lutheros ta prosto koinon politu omen. Lego king eita holy, taste eladox, I juicing ena. In today's lecture, we're going to examine the career of the leading Athenian politician in the period from 443 to 429, Pericles, son of Xanthippus, of the deem of Hologos. We've met him already, and it was Pericles who assisted Ephialtes in his reform of the Areopagus, and it was he too who guided Athens towards extreme democracy. I've called this lecture the Age of Pericles because that's a term conventionally used to describe the period that saw the dominance of Pericles. But I'll ask you to put it in quotes for now because it's somewhat controversial. And at the end of this lecture, we'll talk about whether it is an appropriate term to describe this 15-year period. Our chief sources are Thucydides, AP, and Plutarch. Thucydides is our sole contemporary source and the only concerns himself with the very end of Pericles' career. He attributes to Pericles the quality that he admired most in a politician, foresight. The Greek word is pronoia, the ability to predict the future, or at least to calculate moves ahead, rather like an expert chess player. The only other politician he ascribes this quality to is Themistocles, because he was chiefly responsible for converting Athens into a naval power. Now, there's a, a caveat. It's sometimes very difficult to escape from the influence of Thucydides. He's so magisterial. And though I admire him greatly, I'm going to raise questions where I think it's appropriate about his judgment. Of our other sources, AP is very brief in his commentary on Pericles, while Plutarch, his biographer, is late 1st, early 2nd century, so he's writing well over half a millennium later. Plutarch, however, is valuable because he fills in some of the gaps left by Thucydides, particularly relating to his personal life. What we don't know is how ordinary Athenians perceived Pericles. We, we know they got angry with him at times, but we don't have any personal testimony from any of them. We also have eloquent archaeological testimonia in the form of the Periclean building program. We'll discuss that in detail in Lecture 15, entitled The Culture of Athenian Democracy. Pericles was an Alcmeonid on his mother's side. That's to say he was blue-blooded. He was a member of the genos, or noble kin group, that was cursed. He's described as a squill head, a squill being a particular genus of plant with a very large bulb. So presumably he had a very large head. He may even have had a cranial deformity. A portrait sculpture that we have of him shows him wearing a helmet, possibly to conceal the shape or size of his head. Thucydides describes him as sober-minded and clear-thinking a man who knew how to keep the mob in check, uh, preventing it from running amok. Aristophanes, in his comedy The Acarnians, describes him as Olympian, which suggests he was aloof, uh, even perhaps antisocial. One thing we do know, he didn't concern himself with his ratings, or the equivalent back then, his sense of how the demos responded to him. In fact, he belonged to that all too rare breed of politicians that is completely indifferent to what people think about them. And judging from the circle Pericles moved in, he, he wasn't religious, certainly not in the traditional sense of the word. He, he didn't believe that the gods intervene in human affairs any more than Thucydides did. One of his virtues was his incorruptibility. When the Spartan king Archidamus first invaded Attica, he spared Pericles' estate, hoping to get him into hot water with the Deimos by suggesting that he and Pericles were bosom buddies. And Pericles responded by making a present of his estate to the people. And it 
goes without saying that he was an extremely impressive speaker. That's patently clear from Thucydides. We'll examine in detail his most famous speech in Lecture 13. But he's actually left no written evidence behind, and we don't know whether he actually wrote his speeches down. Thucydides wasn't interested in providing us with any background information about Pericles or any details about his private life. He, he didn't think such things were important to his history, or he may have thought that everybody knew about them already. We think very differently today. We put a great deal of importance on background information. Hitler was an artist who failed to get into the Vienna Academy of Art. Had he won a scholarship, history would have turned out very differently. We know from his biographer Plutarch, however, that Pericles' life was not without scandal. He divorced his Athenian wife and cohabited with a woman from Miletus, northwest Turkey, named Aspasia. We've talked about her already. Aspasia was what we would call his common law wife, and she's one of the very few women living in Athens in the classical era whom we know anything about. She was what the Greeks called a hetaira, uh, literally a female companion. A prostitute, though in her case a very high-class one. She was a good conversationalist and had sound judgment. In fact, she gave advice to Pericles, we're told. And perhaps because of this, their liaison was regarded as scandalous, and Pericles took a lot of flack for it, not least from the comic poets. And some Athenians suspected that Aspasia manipulated Pericles for her own political ends. This suspicion was intensified when Athens went to war with Samos over a quarrel involving Miletus, Aspasia's hometown. But we'll never know the truth behind this. Pericles' career lasted from 462 to 429. Following the assassination of Ephialtes, Pericles was certainly the leader of the democratic faction, but he still had a very powerful enemy in an aristocrat called Cimon. And then in the 450s, Pericles, probably, was the politician who introduced payment for Athenians serving on jurors. Uh, AP says uh, this was a move aimed against Cimon, who was very wealthy and who used bribes to exercise power. In other words, AP suggests that Pericles introduced jury pay to buy political support to counter Cimon. Well, that may or may not be true. Uh, intentions are very difficult to work out. And then in 451 0, a law attributed to Pericles was passed limiting a citizenship to men with an Athenian mother as well as an Athenian father. And in 448, it was definitely Pericles who recommended that the surplus tribute from the Allies be used to finance an ambitious building program, the rebuilding of temples on the Acropolis that had been destroyed by the Persians. A politician called Thucydides, son of Melesias, uh, not to be confused with Thucydides, the historian, objected strongly to this. And indeed, it's likely to have been a very controversial decision. That's because there's evidence to suggest that after their final victory over the Persian army at Plataea in Boeotia, central Greece, 479, the Greek states had taken an oath the so-called Oath of Plataea, to preserve their ruined temples in their current condition as memorials to Persian barbarity. Now, that would have been similar to the decision taken by the Jewish people not to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem erected by Herod the Great after its destruction by the Romans in AD 70. Supericles may well have been recommending that the Athenians violate a sacred oath. He prevailed, however, and his opponent, Thucydides, was ostracized, probably in 443. Incidentally, Plutarch depicts Thucydides as a highly divisive politician who was responsible for polarizing the Deimos, not least by having his supporters sit all together in the assembly. Plutarch claims that after Thucydides had been ostracized, 
Pericles was virtually unchallenged until his death in 429. And that, too, is the impression we receive from the historian Thucydides, who says nothing about any opposition that Pericles may have faced until after the Peloponnesian War gets underway. But I think this is unlikely to be the case. Most probably, there was no one of Thucydides' stature to oppose Pericles after he had been ostracized, but that doesn't mean Pericles had a free reign. And as we shall see, he had to contend with legal challenges, no doubt engineered largely by his political enemies. But it is with some justification that historians refer to this 15-year period, at least from a political perspective, as the age of Pericles. And that's because Pericles was elected strategos, or general, every year, with just one exception during this period. And that was what his authority rested on. He held no other executive position in the state. This meant that he was, in effect, in charge of what we would call today Athenian foreign policy. And that policy, as we saw in the previous lecture, imposed harsh terms on disaffected allies and advocated the use of allied tribute for Athens's own civic needs. And it also encouraged Athenian imperial expansion. Pericles differed sharply from Cimon in this respect. Whereas Cimon was friendly to Sparta, Pericles saw Sparta as a rival to Athenian power. And in fact, it can be argued that Pericles directed Athenian policy in such a way that it resulted in the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. So, though Pericles had no real political challenger of his stature after Thucydides was ostracized, he still had his enemies, as I've indicated. And his enemies got at him by attacking his friends through the law courts. We know from Plutarch that Pericles' friends included the sophist Protagoras, who declared that man is the measure of all things. And the sculptor Phidias, who crafted the gold and ivory statue of Athena that stood inside the Parthenon. And the philosopher Anaxagoras, who declared that mind is the cause and origin of the universe. Phidias was the supervisor of the building project on the Acropolis that Pericles initiated. He was accused of stealing gold that was intended for the great statue. And this was a clever way to get at Pericles because Phidias was not only a close friend of Pericles but also on the board of supervisors for the project and, and so responsible for its finances. Plutarch, who is our source for this, says that some of the accusers were testing the waters to see what the demos might do if they directly attacked Pericles instead of one of his friends. And this seems, I think, highly likely. In the event, Phidias was acquitted, though his, he later became the object of attack by a decree introduced by a certain Diapithes, which condemned various kinds of irreligiosity, including atheism. Diapithes alleged that Phidias used his own portrait for one of the figures on Athena's shield, specifically, Plutarch says, that of an old bald man lifting up a stone with both hands. And he further alleged that one of the figures on the metopes, the rectangular blocks that were placed above the columns on the Parthenon, was a portrait of Pericles. Well, this time, Phidias wasn't so lucky. He was found guilty and had to go into exile. Another of his friends who was attacked in the courts was the philosopher Anaxagoras, notorious for denying that the sun and the moon were gods. And he too was charged with impiety and, and Pericles had to ask him to leave Athens. But more serious than either of these cases, Aspasia, too, was accused of impiety, as well as of procuring women for Pericles' personal enjoyment. We're told that Pericles came into court and broke down in tears 
to plead successfully for her acquittal. I find myself reminded of the McCarthy era. The charges laid against all these individuals were somewhat nebulous and in many cases difficult to refute. And they were led by individuals with a political agenda. I believe there can be little doubt that it was Pericles' intransigence towards the Spartans that caused the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, even though, technically, it was Sparta that declared war on Athens. Pericles was intractable. He argued against Athens making any concessions to the beef that Sparta had with Athens over some territorial claims. And it's clear, too, that the Spartans held Pericles directly responsible. Just before the war broke out, they made a final demand to, quote, expel the accursed one. A, a clear reference to uh, Pericles' membership of the aristocratic Alcmeonid Genos. There was certainly some strong opposition in Athens to going to war, but Pericles managed to override it. That's because his authority in 431 was massive. Pericles' strategy was essentially passive. He believed that the Athenian fleet was all-powerful and that as long as the Athenians didn't engage the Spartans on land, they would be invincible. So he argued that they should engage in a war of attrition and that the Spartans would eventually give up because they would realize they just couldn't win. It was Pericles who persuaded the Athenians to turn their city with its long walls, connecting it to the port city of the Piraeus, into an island and abandon the countryside. So it was Pericles, in a sense, too, who was directly responsible for the plague that afflicted Athens in the opening years of the war, though Thucydides doesn't blame him for this or indeed make any direct connection between the increase in the population living inside the walls and the plague. The plague reduced Athens' population by as much as a quarter or even a third, and I'll talk about it in a later lecture. Pericles was a typical theorist. He thought war was like playing checkers, all very logical. He didn't allow for the psychological, and for all his powers of forethought, he certainly didn't predict the consequences of cooping the population up inside the city walls. Following the invasion of Attica by the Spartans in the first year of the war, the Demos became inflamed against Pericles because, as Thucydides tells us, they were forced to observe their lands being ravaged before their very eyes and were unable to do anything about it. And this brought back bad memories to the elderly of what they had suffered 30 years ago when King Xerxes had invaded Attica and done the same thing. Pericles realized that the Deimos was on the verge of revoking his policy of remaining inside the walls and that they wanted to engage the Peloponnesians in what he judged would lead to certain defeat. And so, for 40 days, he refused to call a meeting of the assembly. Quite how he was able to do this is a mystery. Uh, we don't hear of any other general having the power to prevent the assembly from meeting. Soon after, however, he was back in favor with the Deimos, which chose him to deliver the speech over the dead who had fallen in the first year of the war. And it's one of the most extraordinary and inspiring speeches ever delivered. And, and as I said, I shall be devoting a whole lecture to it. The next year, however, the Deimos became even more angry with Pericles than they had been before. The Peloponnesians raided their lands for the second time, and they had also become victims of a terrible plague. Thucydides writes, they blamed Pericles on the grounds that he was the cause of the war and the source of their misfortunes. They even tried to make peace with the Spartans, but to no avail. They were reduced to a state of total despair and vented their anger on Pericles, Thucydides writes. It's worth 
pausing for a moment to reflect upon Thucydides' account here. He presents the demos as a kind of many-headed monster, everybody thinking alike and, and lacking the backbone to stick with the policy it had voted for at the outset. Well, there's no question whose side we are supposed to be on as we read his narrative. And it's now that Thucydides puts a speech, his third and final speech, into the mouth of Pericles. Thucydides tells us that it was Pericles who called the assembly, just as it was he who had previously refused to allow anyone to call one. So Pericles takes the floor, and what he does is to lecture the Athenians for being so spineless and wishy-washy and not sticking by the policy they had signed off on. And when I say he lectures the Athenians, well, that's putting it rather mildly. He gives them a piece of his mind. You've no business being angry with me. No one is better informed about what is the best public policy or better at implementing it. And I'm also a patriot and a man of complete integrity. Now, that's not a paraphrase. That's a literal translation. And then he roars. Well, I, I think of him as roaring at this point. I am the same and I don't change. It's you who change. The rest of his speech is a justification of his policy. He points out how powerful Athenians are because their fleet is utterly invincible. And then he delivers the famous line, the empire you hold is a tyranny. It may have been wrong to acquire it, but it would be dangerous to let it go. After that, there's a lot of talk about fighting for the glory of Athens because Athens rules more Greeks than any other polis. But the upshot is that Pericles succeeds in dissuading the Athenians from sending ambassadors to Sparta to make peace. But they're still angry with him. And their anger doesn't abate until they have relieved him of his post of strategos. And then comes one of the most scathing sentences in all of Thucydides. Not long afterwards, he writes, as the masses is wont to do, they elected him strategos and turned all their affairs over to him, as the masses are wont to do. That's Thucydides' view of the fickleness of the mob. Pericles died as a result of the plague in 429, poetic justice of a kind. Immediately after narrating the aftermath to this speech, Thucydides delivers his obituary of Pericles. He writes, Pericles because of his reputation, his intelligence, and his transparent incorruptibility, was able to respect the liberty of the people while at the same time holding them in check. It was he who led them rather than they who led him. And a little later, he says that under Pericles' leadership, it was democracy in name, but rule by one man in fact. In other words, he suggests that Athenian democracy under Pericles was a disguised autocracy. And this, as you can readily guess, is a hugely controversial statement. It, it questions the very essence of Athenian democracy in the period of Pericles' dominance. In fact, it, it goes so far as to question whether there was democracy in the period of Pericles' dominance. One of the problems in trying to assess Thucydides' assessment of Pericles is that he never actually shows him in debate. He reports three of his speeches, but each time Pericles speaks, it is without an opponent. So that in itself raises him above the fray, suggesting that he existed above the fault lines in the democracy, which of course is false because the Athenian assembly, as Arlene Saxonhaus has noted, Quote, is a constantly fluctuating conglomeration of particular individuals. One reason, I believe, why Athens was a fully functioning democracy under Pericles is that Pericles and his mistress, Aspasia, were subject to ridicule by the comic poets. The poets would never have got away with this if Pericles had so dominated the political landscape that he was able to stifle criticism and discontent. Immediately after Thucydides has given his assessment of Pericles, he passes judgment on his successors. He writes, 
his successors were more on an equality with one another and each one vying to become first. They even directed the affairs of state to the pleasure of the Deimos. What he means is that Athens fell under the control of demagogues. Thucydides is drawing a line between Pericles, who was above the fray, and the demagogues, in his view, who were contemptible crowd pleasers. I have to say, and I'm certainly not the first to say this, this is a bogus distinction. As the historian Joseph Vogt points out, it's impossible to suppose that the successors of Pericles corrupted the Deimos in merely two years. Uh, corruption, if that's the word, had already been going on under Pericles. In other words, Pericles was just as much a demagogue as his successors were. And I'll, I'll talk about his successors in Lecture 16. There's another problem, a deeper, more thorny problem that is this one. Thucydides seems to be an unqualified fan of Pericles, but was he? He certainly wasn't blind to the fact that the sublime view of Athens that Pericles paints in his funeral speech was in fact tinsel thin. The plague, which immediately followed afterwards, demonstrated the hollowness of many of his claims. The picture he paints of Athens was false advertising, alternative facts, if you like, without any solid foundation. And there's another intriguing point. Thucydides puts some of Pericles' most characteristic statements into the mouth of Cleon, a, a demagogue whom Thucydides hated and despised. And does that mean that Pericles' words were, when it came down to it, mere empty rhetoric, no different from the rhetoric of any snake oil salesman? Uh, this is probably going too far, but I don't think we should assume that Thucydides was entirely uncritical of Pericles. Finally, is the title of this lecture a misnomer? Was there really an age of Pericles? The concept of an age of Pericles is due in part to our fascination with classical Athens at this precise moment in its history, and also to our desire to hang a name on an era that epitomizes for many the height of the classical period. Classical refers to the period from 490 to 323 BC, from the Battle of Marathon to the death of Alexander the Great. So the so-called age of Pericles technically covers a period of half a generation from the 440s until his death in 429. So let's, for the sake of argument, say that it does exist. What then were its characteristics? Well, one, it was a period of infancy for the radical democracy, when it was still reliant on aristocrats, specifically one aristocrat. That's to say, it was paternalistic in some ways. A second, it was a period when Athens took a major step towards becoming an imperial power, and in so doing, effectively enslaved other Greeks. And third, it was a period when the Parthenon and the Propylaea, the monumental entrance gateway to the Acropolis, were built, in which Pericles took a leading hand, when classical sculpture reached its height, and finally when Sophocles and Euripides and other literary giants were alive and flourishing and boosting Athens's cultural prominence. Like the tyrant Pisistratus before him, Pericles, through his policies, expanded Athens's role as a center of Greek culture. So yes, it definitely had a specific character. And after the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, and following the death of Pericles that occurred soon afterwards, Athens was never the same again. So, with reservation, I think we can let the title stand. Pericles was able to dominate Athenian politics, partly because he was a strategos and partly because he was an extremely effective orator. You couldn't gain the full respect of your fellow citizens in Athens if you couldn't argue your case before a large audience. In the next lecture, we're going to examine how the Athenians learned to speak in public. We're also going to examine, in some detail, the debates that Thucydides records, which took place in time of war, so that we can understand the arguments that orators employed to win approval.
for their policies.